Now let's take a look at what the evidence says about the heckscher olin theorem. But of course, you should be watching this in conjunction with our video on the heckscher olin theorem itself. We're going back to the key question of what explains trade. And here we're talking about the quantity, the direction, and also the composition of that trade. One possible nomination for an explanatory factor about trade is factor intensities, namely whether your country has a lot of capital or a lot of labor relative to other countries in the world. So just to recap the heckscher olin theorem, or HOT for short, it's saying that capital-intensive countries, by global standards that is, should be exporting capital-intensive products. Similarly, labor-intensive countries, again by global standards, should be exporting labor-intensive products. You can think of these propositions as a way of making the theory of comparative advantage just a little more concrete. So, for instance, if your country has a lot of capital relative to global standards, you might expect that, all other things being equal, that country will be very good at exporting capital-intensive products. In any case, that's the hypothesis which the heckscher olin theorem is directing our attention to. But of course, we run up against that very tough question, is this actually true? Now enter Vasily Leontiev, who later won a Nobel Prize in economics. He published a very famous paper in 1953, and in that paper he calculated the labor output and capital output ratios for a variety of sectors in the American economy. He also calculated how much capital and how much labor are embodied in exports. And here's the problem. By global standards, as you might expect, the United States measured as capital intensive. Yet if you look at the content of American exports, in Leontiev's paper he found that the U.S. exports on net labor-intensive goods, and it imports on net capital-intensive goods, and of course that's exactly the opposite of what the heckscher olin theorem would lead you to believe. Actually, ever since Leontiev's paper in the 1950s, the empirical status of heckscher olin has been somewhat in a state of crisis. And so this is a puzzle which researchers have been trying to solve for the last 60 years. Another important test, again with largely negative results, came in a famous paper by Bowen, Lemer, and Zweikowskis published in 1987. They developed what is called the sign test. To do the sign test, you start by looking at a country's factor endowment. For instance, you might decide that a particular country is capital intensive. You then want to ask about the exports of that country. Will the exports of that country also be capital intensive? In essence, you're testing to see if you can find the same sign. Yet for that simple test, using global data, actually the heckscher olin theorem fails at least one-third of the time. The authors also develop what is called the rank test. So let's say we look at a country which ranks, say, at number three when it comes to labor intensity of its factors. We would expect that same country, when you're looking at the factor content of its exports, to rank very high when it comes to labor intensity of exports. Yet in general, that is not the case. The rank order of factor intensity in a country does not very well predict the rank order of factor content in that country's exports. Instead, a country which ranks really high in terms of having a lot of labor will be exporting more capital in its goods than you might have otherwise tended to expect. Further empirical problems for the heckscher olin theorem came out of a 1995 paper by Treffler called The Case of the Missing Trade and Other Mysteries. The missing trade puzzle is this. Given that there are big differences in factor endowments across countries, we should in fact expect to see much more trade than what we actually observe. Furthermore, the trade we do see on net doesn't actually send much embodied capital to the labor-intensive countries or much embodied labor to the capital-intensive countries, so there's hardly any trade in net factor content. I find this a very useful perspective. 
the observed deviations from Heckscher Olin, you can read them as really asking, why isn't there in the global economy much more trade than what we observe? It's really a Kosian question about why are transactions costs so high and limiting what are potentially mutually beneficial exchanges. Another observed puzzle from the missing trade paper is this, namely that poor countries export less than is predicted by theory, and they import more than is predicted by theory. There's some difficulty in getting those countries to be viable sellers on a large scale, which our theory isn't quite picking up. So given all these problems, can we in fact save the heckscher olin theorem when it comes to empirics? And it turns out there actually is a way forward which makes the theory more defensible. Let's go back to the original Leontief critique. Leontief classified the United States as capital intensive. But you might ask, well, who says the United States is in fact capital intensive? You can add up the labor in the United States and you can add up the capital, but what's the natural unit of measurement? You might argue that if the United States has different technologies than other countries, which indeed it does, well, we need to sum up labor in the United States to take account of the quality of labor in the United States, because the quality of labor is augmented by how much capital we have invested. So once we allow for different technologies, and once we allow for the fact that labor may be more effective in some countries than others, well, there exist measures that make the U.S. labor-intensive rather than capital-intensive, and then the Leontief paradox would go away because we would be measuring the U.S. as labor-intensive and finding that U.S. exports are also labor-intensive. To go back to our video on the theory of Heckscher and Olin, keep in mind we really did assume a common technology across all countries. And when you have a common technology, it's relatively easy to add up which countries are labor-intensive or capital-intensive. But when that technology is varying, we then have to worry not just about the quantity of labor in a country, but how effective that labor is. There's even a way to make the heckscher olin theorem a kind of tautology. If you observe that the United States is exporting labor-intensive goods, simply postulate that we have technologies so that when you combine them with labor, the degree of quote-unquote effective labor in this country is so high that we're actually labor-intensive after all. And indeed, there's an interesting test of the heckscher olin theorem within a single country, looking only at regions of Japan, and of course within Japan, a relatively homogeneous country, you would expect technology across the different regions to be more or less constant. And what is it we find? Well, when technology is more or less uniform, the predictions of the heckscher olin theorem do pretty well. And in fact, it's the capital-intensive regions of Japan which are exporting capital-intensive goods to other parts of Japan. Well, what to do? So there's now a whole new research program. What you can do is take observed heckscher olin theorem violations then see, given those violations, what is the implied difference in technologies across borders, and then you can do independent tests to see if these differences are in fact true. The original postulated version of the heckscher olin theorem still is turning out to be false, but the theorem remains nonetheless useful. If you take the theorem and you modify the assumption of identical technologies, the combination of the theorem and an account of technological differences still will give you a kind of useful hammer for explaining some patterns of global trade. In this sense, the heckscher olin research paradigm is alive and well. This point about technology differences directs our attention to a fundamental link between the heckscher olin theorem and the lack of what is called factor price equalization across borders. That is, returns to capital and returns to labor do not equalize across borders, do not equalize across rich and poor countries. This, too, in part, is because countries have different technologies or maybe even different cultures. In this regard, you can think of a culture as a technology. So there's this fundamental factor, some kind of differences across countries 
which prevent perfect factor price equalization, and they prevent the heckscher olin theorem from holding. And we're back to this basic fundamental philosophical question that we have two literatures on international trade, heckscher olin theorem and factor price equalization, and they're both getting at what is basically the same question, how and why is it that countries are different, and how is it that those differences inhibit the amount of trade? The literature on the heckscher olin theorem and related issues, of course, continues to grow. So some of the questions that people are working on now is trying to disaggregate the data better so you're not just dealing with economy-wide or sector-wide measures of factor intensity, and also studying firm-level export decisions, again a move in the direction of greater disaggregation. The heckscher olin theorem continues to generate fruitful puzzles for people to work on. This video already has listed plenty of sources and papers to read, but for overviews I found the following especially helpful. There's a paper by Heltman online called The Structure of Foreign Trade, and it provides an overview of some of these debates. The book by Robert Feenstra, Advanced International Trade, and the undergraduate text by Feenstra and Taylor give very good surveys on the heckscher olin theorem. There's also a paper online by Davis and Weinstein called what role for empirics in international trade. For closely related issues to heckscher olin see also our videos covering the topics of increasing returns and international trade, the gravity equation, and also factor price equalization.